in our discussion tonight, we'll examine the circumstances of the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married multiple women when he was in Medina and in fact he married more than four. Now Islam limits it to four for other men but for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know some hadith state 13, some 16, some even go up to 19 and that when he passed away he had nine wives that survived after him. So it's very important to discuss what were the circumstances of the Prophet that called on him to enter those multiple marriages. Um, this is an area that historically Orientalists have tried to use against the Prophet and Islam and uh, to accuse the Prophet of following his desire. So the first point I'd like to discuss with you, were these marriages out of personal desire? See, what are some clues that point us to the following point, that it was not out of personal desire? First of all, how come most of the women, nearly all of them, that the Prophet married, they were previously married before? In, in, in Arabic, they're called thayyib. The Quran refers to that. We have Bikr and Thayyib. Bikr is the woman who's been never married before. Thayyib is the woman who's been previously married. And as we saw with some of the wives of the Prophet, they were married twice before. And the Prophet married them. I want you now to understand the culture of Arabia a little bit. 14 centuries ago, if you go to the Arabian Peninsula, a rich Meccan or a rich Arabian man who could afford multiple marriages, those who were driven by personal desire and they had the finances and the money or the social position to do that, when they would marry a second wife, a third, fourth, whatever it was, what kind of a wife would they choose for themselves? Young and virgin. They would normally speaking not marry a widow, not marry a divorcee. If it was out of personal desire, they stayed away from that. Why? because that first option was more attractive to them. For the Arabs it was a big deal if a girl was married or not married before and that's why the dowry for a virgin was a lot more than the dowry of a divorcee in their culture of course. So the one who was not married she was sought after, she was considered as the best option and she would fulfill their desire in a better way. This is the Arab mentality. Now this doesn't apply in all societies. You could say today in the West, no, people don't look at it that way. Well, I'm talking about Arabian society, that's how it was. Whereas with the Prophet ﷺ, we see that he's not seeking virgins. In fact, most of his wives are either widows or divorcees. What does that tell you? It's not out of desire. There's another element here. There's another reason that's pushing the Prophet to marry them. It's definitely not desire because if it was an issue of desire, marry the young and the virgin. Why are you marrying the older and the divorcee and the widow? And who's going to say no to you? Because it was normal in that society. There was nothing immoral about it. There was nothing inappropriate about it. So the Prophet could have easily done that without any repercussions without any consequences. Why did he not do that? What does that indicate about these marriages? That's the second point. When did he enter these marriages? After the age of 53, when he went to Medina. When the Prophet was in his youthful days, he stayed with Lady Khadija how many years? From the age of 25. 25 to the age of about 50, right? 25 years. The Prophet lived in a monogamous relationship for 25 years. And remember the offers the pagans made for him. Because someone could argue, okay, in Mecca he was not a community leader yet. Maybe he didn't have that much money. Uh, maybe he couldn't for whatever reason. In Mecca, the pagans came to his uncle Abu Talib and they made the following offer. They told him, look, just talk to your nephew to stop this new religion. Whatever he wants, we'll give him. He wants money, we'll make him the king of Mecca. We'll pour our gold and silver on him. He wants women, we'll give him our youngest, most beautiful woman. What does he want? 
He came to the Prophet, he told him the offer of the pagans, the Prophet rejected, he said, no, that's not my point. If they put the sun in my right hand, the moon in my left, to give up this religion, I won't. What does that tell you about this, the character of this man? If he was a man of personal desire, why did he not take these opportunities? Why didn't he not get married in Mecca? Why did he stay in a relationship with Lady Khadija for 25 years? Later, now that he's old, he's got a million things on his head, now he thinks of marrying all these women? That in itself is clear evidence for anybody who's not biased, anybody who's fair and objective, that he had other reasons for this marriage. It was not out of personal desire. Yes? Um, I'm, I'm just curious, I'm not sure if you addressed this in previous uh, sessions of this class, but what year was it when Abu Talib was told to approach Rasulullah with this proposition? So we find that it was early on. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after وَأَنذَرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Maybe this, is, this happened between years three and four. We can estimate it was around three and four. So how old was the Prophet at the time? He was around 43 years old, right? So he was 42, 43, they made him this offer. Why didn't he accept? So all those years, the Prophet ﷺ had the opportunity to marry any woman he wanted. Remember, he comes from Bani Hashim. He comes from a respected family. And any father um, would have had the honor of giving his daughter to a, a good, decent man like the Prophet ﷺ. Yet he said no. And in Medina, he did not prefer young, beautiful virgins. And any tribe, had the Prophet wanted that, any tribe would have had the honor to give their daughters. No father in Medina would have said, no, I'm not going to give my young daughter to you. In fact, it's my dream for the Prophet to ask my daughter because he becomes my son-in-law. That was their dream. They loved the Prophet so much. But he never did that in Medina. Why? In fact, we don't have a single hadith that says the Prophet married and lived with a virgin in Medina. Not a single one. All those wives he married in Medina, other than Aisha, which even that there's a discussion on by the way, but I don't want to get into it. But let's go with the mainstream Muslim view that she was a virgin, right? Because there is one view that she was previously married, we'll not get into that. Other than Aisha, which they say the contract happened in Mecca, and he you know, married her in Medina. Other than that, he did not marry any other woman in, in uh, Medina that was a virgin. So what does that tell you about the character of the Prophet? So that in itself is evidence it was not out of desire. There was another reason. Number two, the Prophet ﷺ, according to verse 28 of Surah Al-Ahzab, the Prophet made it very clear to, this woman, to these women that look, you women are not stuck with me in this marriage. If you want dunya, you want this world, the adornments of this world, the distractions of this world, you're free to go. I'll let you go without being an abusive husband who's forcing you to stay with me. And if you want Allah, the Prophet and a humble life, then you feel free to stay with me. Which man who acts out of desire says that publicly to his wives? Show me, show me one, one, one example in history. Have you found a caliph, a sultan in history, with all the harems that they had, all the women that they had in their harems, saying to them, you know, if you want me and uh, my humble life or my whatever life, stay with me. Otherwise, nobody says that. Have you heard a king saying that to any of his women? No, because those men of desire, it's not like they gave the woman a choice. You're stuck with me, that's it, because I'm staying with you for a personal desire. So I want that desire to be met. I'm not going to be that flexible. They become possessive. The Prophet was never possessive. The Prophet says in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 28, Allah says, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the Prophet, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, Allah is telling him, O oh Prophet, say to your wives, Qul li azwajika, in kuntunna turidna al-hayat al-dunya, if you want this life, the slow life, meaning the materialistic life, wazinataha, and be distracted by the adornments of life, fata'alayna, Come, I'll let you go peacefully, Jamila, in a beautiful way, we'll part our ways, I respect you, respect me, go and live your life. Nobody's forcing you to stay with me. I'm not here to give you dunya, and I'm not here to enjoy dunya. When 
Yes, if you really want Allah, you want to sacrifice, you want the Prophet, you want the Akhirah, then you're welcome to stay and Allah will give you a reward for being with the Prophet and serving the Prophet. See, this is an indication that the Prophet was not a possessive man of desire. No, he had other reasons for these marriages. It was not out of desire. And this in itself is proof. And this is not a secret. It's in the Quran. Millions of Muslims have read this. And all the companions knew about this verse. So any woman, any woman after this verse, she could have gone to the masjid and say, hey people, oh look, Allah is giving me the option to leave. I don't want to stay in this marriage. Nobody's forcing you. Tfaddali, leave you. Go ahead. Yes, brother. Well, I mean, most of these people who come and attack Rasulullah in this manner and say he was acting out of desire, they also say that he made up the Quran. Like, well, if he's making up the Quran, why would he? Why would he put restrictions on himself? Okay. Tell, a, tell an orientalist, exactly, tell an orientalist, fine, your argument is he wrote the Quran, okay, why, why limit yourself like that? Why give your women ammunition against you? That if you don't want me, leave. No king says that, I've not heard of a king who says that, or a sultan who says that, because those were out of desire, the harems and whatever they had. Did you ever hear they gave uh, an option? Yeah, okay, today 400 women in the harem, you, you get to leave if you want to leave. <laughs> no, no I've, I've not heard that in history. <laughs> I've not, I've not, see, but the Prophet in the Quran, he made that public announcement. So whether God wrote it as we believe, or the Prophet made it as they believe, the point is he publicly announced this, and he read it in the masjid. Why would you put that ammunition in the hands of your woman? That in itself shows he was sincere in those relationships. He had a noble cause. It was not out of desire. That in itself is sufficient to prove this point. So this is the second point. Number three, the Prophet's marriages and relationships never distracted him from his work, from his obligation, and never was it conducted in an immoral way like those caliphs, sultans and kings who would bring hundreds of women in a harem and everyone knew it's, it's just for pleasure. The Prophet, even though he married multiple women, we don't see any person, even in that society, shaming the Prophet for it. You know, what, what are you, a man of desire? And no one even said that because it was so clear it's not the case. And the Prophet was never distracted by his work. See, it's not like uh, those people of desire who make this a part of their daily schedule to be with those women. No, that's my priority. I need to have my entertainment session at night. The Prophet what he needed to get done, he did. Leading, going out to war. Do you know how many times the Prophet went out into an expedition? If you're a man of desire, you know, you don't want to do that because when you're there in the battlefield or going to war, obviously you're away from those women. The Prophet never calculated it this way. My job is to go now and pray and lead the community and spend hours outside, travel for months and months in those 10 years, I will do that. So these marriages never, never stopped him from preaching the word of God, from being a good role model, from being a good community leader. That in itself is an indication these marriages were noble, not out of desire. Because if it's out of desire, then a person has to fulfill that desire. And sometimes you sacrifice work and something for that desire. How come we never see the Prophet sacrificing that? Because his point was not desire. So that's the third point. The fourth point, the fourth point. Some of the marriages that the Prophet entered were not even consummated. I'll talk about them later and we'll mention those women. And basically, some tribes were desperate to have the honor of the Prophet marrying a woman from their tribe. And the Prophet made it clear to them that look, you know, I've achieved my goals with Islam and honestly I don't have a reason to get married now. The tribes are begging him. He's like, I fulfilled my job. All those reasons that I married for, they're, they're fulfilled. So I don't have an additional reason. But then he did not want to break their heart. And the tribe was like, you know, the Prophet rejected our offer. And the Prophet was very sensitive about rejecting people. So he's like, okay, bring your daughter, I'll marry her with her consent, but the marriage won't be consummated. She'll be known as my wife and then she can go back to the tribe. They accept it, like okay that's a good deal. 
at least she has the honor of having a marriage contract with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. so we can still consider you our son-in-law according to Arab custom. What does that indicate about the Prophet? If they're begging and they're bringing their daughter, well why not? If he was a man of desire, okay accept it, it's a perfect opportunity. They're bringing these girls for you or these women for you and uh, they want the honor. Why would you say no? So he tried to say no, they got upset, he's like okay let's just do a verbal contract and then we'll, you know basically he said go back to the tribe and the marriage, so with two or three wives of the Prophet, the marriage was not consummated. Even if the non Muslim was to say well, even if he tried to say no, he eventually said yes, they still weren't consummated. So. Exactly, so how come the marriage was not consummated? That in itself is evidence that the Prophet was not pursuing desire. Even when others asked him to fully marry these women, you know, he's like, I've achieved my goal, there's no reason now. So now what were the motives then? Why did the Prophet marry this woman briefly? We'll mention five or six motives. Number one, we've referred to this before, the humanitarian motive. Remember, sometimes these women, they'd embrace Islam, then they'd migrate, and then the husband either dies or he's killed in the battlefield, and her only option was to go back to her family. Well, her family's pagans. Going back to her family meant persecution, pressure, physical abuse, or forcing her to convert out of Islam. There was no other option with the pagans. So either they would persecute her every day until they'd eventually kill her, or they told her, you want to stay safe? Give up Islam. This was the alternative for that woman. So the Prophet recognized that, to protect her from that and the Prophet saw none of the companions came forward to marry this woman and accept her and care for her, so the Prophet said, okay I'll take the initiative. So a number of the wives of the Prophet, three or four wives of the Prophet, the Prophet married them purely for humanitarian reasons, to protect her from that fate. So in other words, the Prophet is telling her, look, I appreciate your sacrifice. You migrated, you left your hometown, your city for my religion. Of course, it's Allah's religion, but defending me. Your husband died, your guardian died, and you're stuck now. You don't, you don't know what to do. And remember, a woman in Arabia staying without a male relative guardian made her so vulnerable. It, 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 was, a, it was dishonor for her. If you don't have a father, a brother, or a husband to protect you, people are like, you know, you're, you're like a homeless person these days. And the Prophet did not want this for these women. So you go back to your hometown, persecution, death, or conversion. You stay here, it doesn't look good for you. You look weak and like a homeless woman. So the Prophet, for humanitarian reasons, he numbered a, mary, a number of those wives, we mentioned them before. So that's one reason, the humanitarian reason. Number two, and this is really important, the political reason. The Prophet married women from numerous tribes, such that you don't really find the Prophet marrying uh, two women from one tribe. He tried as much as he could to marry the women from various tribes. Why? To neutralize these, to neutralize these tribes. See, remember that the Prophet, when he started Islam, the tribes in Arabia united against him. They basically fought him. Even at the Battle of Ahzab in Medina, the Ahzab are those tribes that united against the Muslims. So the Prophet had this constant challenge and struggle. These multiple tribes uniting against him to fight him and kill him and kill Muslims. Well, Arabs, given that they had a tribal mentality, they had this protocol, this de facto law, that if you marry a woman from my tribe, and so you become our son-in-law, we can't fight you anymore. We have to reconcile, and in fact we have to even support you, because now you're our son-in-law, and abandoning you looks bad in the Arabian Peninsula, like oh you, you're abandoning your own son-in-law, it did not look good for them. So this was a very, very tactical, effective way for the Prophet to diffuse the hatred of the tribes, to unite them 
and to allow those tribes to accept him and the Muslims. It was a very brilliant move by the Prophet to marry a woman from their daughter, uh, from, from their tribe. So we find that the Prophet is using this as a political strategy. A lot of the wives of the Prophet, that's what applies to them. Now I have a question for you. The answer to this is a little bit tough, so help me out here. Some will object, is that a moral thing to do, to use a woman as a political card? Because when we say the political factor, basically what we're saying is the Prophet just used these women for a political means. Okay, we understand his means, they're important means, but in the end he's using these women. Is that right to do, to use women for political gains? Even if you're trying to avoid war, you're trying to unite. But in the end, he didn't marry them for them, for who they are. He married them just as a card. And so, is, is this okay to marry someone for a political strategy? What's, what's your answer to that? If she knows, then it's okay. So if she understands the circumstances and the context, and the reason why the Prophet is marrying her, and she's recognized that this is a noble goal, then it's okay. It's not like he tricked them or deceived them. It was, it, was, it was clearly known why the Prophet is proposing from this tribe. Everybody knew why, it was clear. So there was no deception involved. That's, that's one good answer, that they, they knew this. So if somebody knows what they're subscribing to, then why not, what's the problem? Any other answers or angles? Well, I mean, this is kind of, you know, putting the conclusion in front of the argument, but if Rasulullah is doing it, it's obviously as, as a legal precedent, as a moral precedent. If you ever are ruling a country and you need to make political alliances, this is how I do it. The second aspect is the Prophet is a role model. He's teaching others that, look, we have priorities in life. One priority is saving lives. You as political leaders, if in your tribal system to save human life means that you marry from another tribe, okay, you're, you have a noble cause here, what's the problem? In the end you're going to get married, marry someone at least that serves a noble cause. And here's where maybe the Eastern and the Western vision of a marriage may diverge. See, sometimes you marry a woman to have a family. Which wife of the Prophet fulfilled that role? Khadija alayhi salam. So when the Prophet was building a family, he married Khadija for who she is. I want you to raise my children. I want a good decent wife. I love you as my wife and I'm marrying you because you are Khadija, you have these qualities. See, when you're building a family life, yes. You're not using the woman for some other social purpose. No, you want her for who she is. But then, when you have an important goal, which is saving lives, stopping destruction, why is it immoral, why is it bad to marry for that purpose? In fact, in fact, look at the history of Europe, kings and royals commonly did that. You'll find the king of one part of Europe will have his son marry the daughter of another king because there's historical rival, ri rivalry and wars, the king wanted to bring these two nations together so they stopped killing each other. So they would marry a girl from a royal family to build good ties. Is that bad? Historically, is that a bad thing to do? Why is it bad? That's a good noble cause. In the end, the king's son is going to get married. At least marry someone who's going to save lives too. If my marriage saves lives, why not? Of course, the Prophet doesn't say go marry anybody. No, he, he also, you know, married uh, in these circumstances. He looked for certain qualities. But the, 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 the point that he was teaching others, that if you're in a position of leadership, and through marriage, you can serve a noble goal, why not? Do it. Allah will reward you for that. The society will reward you for that. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's not even like, you know, kings and queens, emperors of, of like, you know, centuries ago. The current queen of England, her husband is the prince of some other country's uh, royal family. The current queen, her husband, was the... Is Prince Philip. He's, he's from a different royal family. And they married... Prince Philip it comes from another different royal family. Right, see, we, we have the idea of these political ties. 
Now does that mean the king who allowed his daughter to marry this other royal family, he doesn't love his daughter and he's using her as a card? No, it's his daughter, he loves her. But he recognizes that if I can achieve a higher goal through this marriage, why not? That, that's a noble thing to do. In fact, history praises these kings. And they say, okay, you ended a big war, you ended a historical rivalry through a marriage. Good, good, good for you. <laughs> history praises these people. So why is that bad? That's not exploitation. That's a good, noble cause. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes, I understand today in most marriages, because we don't go, no longer live in a society like that, tribal or royal. Yes, the idea of marriage has changed. Today, marriage is a private, love, romantic relationship. You know, it doesn't serve any other purpose in society other than the relationship itself. We understand that society has shifted, but you have to understand the context in which the Prophet was in. That context, it was perfectly appropriate to do something like that. Maybe today in a lot of parts of the world you can no longer achieve that, maybe. But in that part of the world, it was perfectly acceptable. Well, even I think in America, a lot of, you know, of the well-known political families still marry. Well. Exactly, even today well-known political families, you'll find uh, many, many examples from the famous names in America, the Bushes, the Kennedys, whatever. They have that um, idea of marrying a prominent family for either a political purpose, an economical purpose, right? It could be a financial uh, alliance that you want to uh, enter. It's an alliance. Through people, through marriages, build alliances. And so the Prophet ﷺ was building a political alliance to stabilize Arabia, to save human life. That's noble. It's not a man acting out of desire. This is a man who knows what he's doing. He wants the good of his society. So that's the second factor here. Yes. You said that uh, even when uh, Rasulullah looked in these tribes, he would still look for certain qualities. And he would yes, he would look for certain qualities. It's not like the Prophet says, okay, I just want any girl from any tribe. No, he used some judgment. So some of those women, they were known to be really decent. Like Maria, for example. She's, she was one of the best wives of the Prophet. So then, but Maria and her sister were kind of given as, as gifts from the Prophet. Yes. They were given as slave gifts. We'll talk about, we'll comment on that soon. The Prophet freed them and he married them. So then my question um, was and still is, how did he end up with Aisha and Hafsa? Right. I mean, well, he's looking for certain qualities. We'll talk about that now. Right. Remember, with, with Aisha and Hafsa, we'll comment on it. But the overall idea was to build an alliance. Yet the Prophet did exercise some judgment in terms of the qualities. So well, we'll get to that objection soon. That's the second factor. The third factor is the educational, instructional factor. With which wife of the Prophet? We covered her biography in detail. The Prophet was teaching his society something important or breaking a tradition. Zainab bin Jahs. Remember why the Prophet married her? To break the Arab practice of adoption and also to break racial barriers or socioeconomic barriers. So Zainab was married to a former slave. It's not appropriate for you to marry a woman who was married to a former slave and the Prophet wanted to break that. So some of the marriages of the Prophet were aimed um, at breaking a negative culture or um, teaching something to society. That's the third factor. Number four, the fourth reason the Prophet entered into these marriages is to promote interfaith. See, there were Jewish tribes and non-Muslim tribes that conspired against Muslims. So Muslims had anti-Jewish and anti-Christian sentiments. And so there was some discrimination. And basically they considered all Jews or all, the, all of these non-Muslims from the people of the book as bad and let's fight them. Well, the Prophet told them, look, not all of them are bad. Those who conspired, yes. But there are good Jews, there are good Christians. They didn't get it. How do you break that barrier? Marry a woman who, who came from a Christian tribe, Maria. Marry a woman from a Jewish tribe, Safiya. That promotes interfaith. The day the Prophet married Safiya, the Muslims were like, okay, now if Safiya comes from Jewish tribes, we can no longer attack all Jews. We can't say the Jews and the Jews, no. 
There's bad Jews and there's good Jews. And the Prophet would even remind his own wives. Like sometimes when Aisha would make fun of Safiya, the Prophet would teach Safiya, tell her that I come from, you know, my lineage goes back to Bani Israel. And I know my uncle or my grandfather is Harun. Harun, I have such a great grandfather. What about you? <laughs> See, the Prophet would teach her that, tell her I come from this rich history. And so the Prophet was promoting the spirit of interfaith. Muslims, don't out of backlash go and fight all the people of the book. No, there are good Christians, there are good Jews. And the Prophet marrying a woman who came from those tribes was the most beautiful way to promote that interfaith. So the fourth factor is the interfaith factor, yes. What if someone who's watching this lecture says, okay, say if it's given us the high Allah, we can go and marry any Christian, any Jew, without her having to convert. What would be our response to that? See, if someone really has a noble cause, that they want to marry a Christian lady, to promote interfaith, to really introduce Islam to them, that's fine. If, you, if your marriage is purposeful, you know what you're doing, it's not just a personal desire, you're aware of that, you're acting responsibly, it's okay. Why would that be wrong? That's okay. Does there need to be a purpose or is it okay to marry any kitabi woman? Well, legally for the marriage to be valid, no purpose is required. Because then how do you define what a purpose is? You know, it gets blurry. But the idea that we learn from the Prophet is let it be purposeful. Let your marriage be purposeful. Don't just marry out of desire. So if you want to marry a Christian, or a Jewish, the question is, well, why? Why do you want to marry them? What's, what's your purpose? Because interfaith marriages come with challenges. Raising children, according to which path, they come with challenges. So what's your purpose? If you have a noble purpose, a noble goal, then why not? It's okay. If you're really trying to bring people together, avoid wars, introduce Islam, you live in a very Islamophobic environment. By marrying a, a Christian or a Jewish woman, you break that Islamophobia, why not? That's, that's fine. Allah will reward you for that even, that's okay. So if there's a noble purpose, it becomes mustahab, it becomes recommended. And the Prophet was teaching them, look, there are noble purposes. Sometimes you might have to do that. By the way, they converted. Both Maria and Safiya, they converted when the Prophet married them. They had seen Islam and they converted. But the idea is they came from a Christian background. They came from a Jewish tribe and the Prophet wanted to diffuse that hatred with these other tribes because of the wars that happened. They didn't convert for marriage. No, no, they converted. You know, they, they saw Islam and they saw how Allah supported the Prophet and they converted. They genuinely converted. Especially Maria. We have hadiths that praise her iman and faith. Uh, Safiya, there's some discussion. But Maria, you know, she completely, 100%, genuinely for the sake of Allah, she converted. Not for any other outside pressure. So this is the fourth. The fifth, teaching men who owned a lot of slave girls, free them. And then if you want, marry them, give them status, let freely marry them. This applies to about three women that the Prophet married, such as Juwairiya, Maria also. Maria was a slave girl who was given to the Prophet. The Prophet freed her and then he proposed to her. Now that she's free and the Prophet is proposing to her, she can say yes or no. She willingly married the Prophet. So the Prophet was teaching men, look, don't force these slave girls into these relationships. Free them for the sake of Allah, let them be free women and then marry them. That was a beautiful way to do that. In fact, in fact, <coughs> history has reported that when the Prophet freed and then married Juwairiya, Muslims freed 100 families after that marriage who were enslaved to them, you know, who were slaves to them. 100 families were freed. And even, even some historians say 200 people from the tribe of Juwairiya were freed. They were enslaved, 200 people were freed because they said if the Prophet freed Juwairiya, then he married her, why don't we follow into his footsteps? So one through one single marriage, the Prophet had hundreds of people freed. Isn't that noble? Isn't that beautiful? Basically, the tribe of Juwairiya, they owned a lot of slaves. When the Prophet um, freed her, her tribe was like, you know what, let's free all these other slaves. Why not? Let's learn from the Prophet. That was another purpose. And so we find that it's really a noble purpose coming from the Prophet It's a beautiful purpose.